Hi, welcome to Measured Thoughts. My name is Dave Reepstein. We are fortunate today to be joined by Dan Henson, the Chief Marketing Officer of General Electric. Welcome, Dan. Happy to be here. And glad to have you here. Um, and, and nice to have you launching the Measured Thoughts series that we'll be doing. It's exciting. Um, what I want to know is, uh, tell me your role at GE. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer. So I have functional responsibility for 7,000 marketing employees across the globe, uh, as well as commercial excellence responsibility for our 43,000 sales professionals. And in addition to that, I have advertising and branding and public relations and communications. You've got several different business units within GE, and I say several, which is amazing how many there are. Each one of those business units also has its own chief marketing officer? Right. At General Electric, we have a functional organization. So every one of our business units, no matter how large or small they are, is likely to have a chief marketing officer who would report up the line. Uh, and so everybody typically has two bosses, a direct to the P&L leader and then functional to whoever is uh, above them in the marketing organization. And how do those chief marketing officers of each of the of the business units report into you or, or relate to you? Most of the larger business units will report directly to me on a functional basis. Uh, some of the smaller ones will roll up within a particular segment, but ultimately the line leads up to me from a functional standpoint. Okay. Let's talk about how marketing really helps GE accomplish its objectives. Right. Well, I think, you know, first, it's probably important just to, to level set. We are primarily a B2B company. We do have consumer products, obviously, our appliances and our lighting. Um, but even there, we have a strong b 2 b to c component. So unlike Procter & Gamble, we spend a lot less time um, advertising to the consumer or worrying about product positioning in-store um, a lot of what we do are things like energy turbines or aircraft engines. But that's not to say that marketing plays a lesser role. It's no, just a different type of role. Not at all. And uh, in, in many ways, um, because a lot of these are long cycle businesses, marketing plays an extremely crucial role because it's uh, impossible to go out and quickly recover uh, from poor market uh, knowledge or positioning. For us, marketing is about understanding what the customer values uh, and what the customer need is, making sure that we have a solid grasp on how GE is positioned relative to those needs that the customer ascribes value to and our competitors, and telling the businesses where to go. So strategy and insights. Correct. And intelligence. And intelligence. Now, when you think about the objectives of GE, what is it that that marketing does to accomplish those objectives? Because what you talked about is that sort of as a process to help that. Right. Are, are, are you responsible for the top line? Well, I, uh, yes. I mean, we're all responsible for the top line, but marketing's primary charter within General Electric is to help us deliver our organic growth goals. Our organic growth goal is widely understood uh, and, and known uh, in the world, which is to grow at two to three times GDP of whatever economy we are playing in. Mm -hmm. That's obviously going to vary a little bit industry to industry. And so our activities are, uh, in theory, the fuel that helps us achieve those goals. How would your CEO answer the question of the role of marketing in accomplishing the objectives? I think, I think Jeff Immelt would, uh, would almost parrot uh, those words, and maybe I'm almost parroting <laughs> right. his words uh, more <laughs> right. appropriately. Um, I don't think we'd have a disconnect at the CEO level. Uh, you know, it's about value gap uh, and understanding that and, and delivering what the customers want and being aware of where our competitors are. I think he'd probably say it's also being able to see what's around the corner. And, and if I asked the same question about the chief financial officer, would there be total alignment along those lines too? Uh, of, there, of, I think of the role of marketing. I think you'd get a. I think you'd get a different view of the role of marketing. I think in an intellectual discussion, the chief financial officer might 
come out parked in the same spot. Uh, but in terms of, of what he would be looking for, it would be more granular um, payback measurements in right. terms of what we got out of this campaign or, well, you spend a million dollars to do that analysis. What did that result in? I think he'd take it down to a level of granularity. Yeah. So actually, how are you measuring whether or not you're fulfilling that role as you defined it? At the high level, we're measuring it on the organic growth rate. Uh, you happen to be here on the day we're announcing our, our third quarter earnings and once again an 8% uh, organic growth rate uh, for the quarter, which, which we're proud of. I mean, just to put it in perspective, in order to hit our organic growth targets in General Electric for 2007, we have to generate the incremental revenues of Nike this year. So about 16 or $17 billion, and that challenge increases every year. So at the top level, uh, it's revenue. So we heard it here first, 8%? It, well, it went out this morning. I oh, wouldn't okay. jump the gun on okay. that, so it's already out there in the public domain. And that's, and by the way, uh, Dave, you know, um, you're, you're, we uh, uh, have shared thought on a, on a number of subjects. Um, you know, marketing is something that is really gaining importance under Jeff Immelt in, in General Electric, and um, he's put a lot of initiative there. Our organic growth rate today is twice what it was in the middle of the 1990s in, in kind of the, the heyday of uh, GE from a stock price standpoint. Yeah, I think the accomplishments have been miraculous, and uh, and you should be congratulated for it. So I think good things are happening at GE. I agree. For sure, for sure. Um, so now let's make a transition, you know, sort of now that we hear the role of what marketing has been and is here, let's make a transition and talk about determining how much you spend on marketing. So I want to think about the budgeting side and I'm going to ask you where that comes from and then also how you think about allocating that budget. Right. We have um, – I won't be able to give you a crisp answer because our philosophy, we're very laissez-faire at headquarters. The actual marketing budgets or the operating budgets of any of the business units are determined within that business unit and they do what they deem appropriate. Typically, from a headcount standpoint, 25 to 5% of the employees – of a business unit are going to be in the marketing organization. In a business like our nuclear business, it's going to be far lower. In our consumer credit card business, it's going to be uh, towards the towards the high end of that range. How high how high would that be roughly? Probably uh, five percent of the employee base. Four or five percent of the employee base might be uh, under the domain of marketing in mm -hmm. a, in one of our consumer facing businesses, um, and the budgets are are commensurate. Um, to to that from an operating standpoint, um, so it's it, you know it rolls up. Corporate has a relatively small operating budget, uh, and we're basically about guiding uh, the business units and uh, making sure that we're focusing on uh, the skills that they have as marketeers. So that's budget for headcount. How about budget for marketing programs? Right, it's going to uh, it's going to be pretty high. Uh, in our, uh, for example, our appliance or our lighting businesses, right. I can't give you a specific figure, um, or our credit card business, and it's going to be relatively minuscule in something like uh, turbine uh, technology or subsea oil and gas uh, platforms. Um, and so that's by business unit. Is there a – you have a budget. Right. And that budget is sort of supporting corporate marketing. Um, how's that determined? I, you know, sit down with the chief financial officer and the CEO of the company, and we talk about what we want to push at the high level. So uh, as, as you're aware of our educational efforts around marketing and commercial skills, we'll develop a specific budget around training uh, design. For example, this year we want to uh, have all 7,000 marketing people receive some level of marketing training. We'll budget specifically for that. Um, we will decide, for example, to uh, promote our eco-imagination campaign, and we'll develop a budget uh, for that at corporate. Um, we also support individual skills initiatives like segmentation and pricing. But each year we start with a zero-based budgeting initiative, and we have a discussion of what do we want to impact in the business units this year. Uh, and so we would develop the appropriate resources to, to, uh, to drive that initiative might involve hiring consultants uh, to push certain ideas. I hope so. You know, uh, or pilots, <laughs> or uh, hiring professors to uh, to help our employees learn more skills. Yeah. 
Um, and then, and so you sort of meet with the CFO and CEO. Correct. And sort of, here's the various different components. Here are the initiatives we want to push this year. This is how much it's going to cost. Um, and then we'll have uh, episodic events. So, for example, we're a top sponsor of the Olympics. Here's what we're going to spend on positioning ourselves for the Olympics. Here's what we're going to spend on building a showcase in Beijing. Here's what we're going to spend on hospitality, um, items like that. But uh, it's all tied to the strategic initiatives or major tactical events. Everything else resides in the business units. One of the most frequent questions I end up being asked is uh, the question about sponsorship. So the Olympics one is a really good one. Um, and people always ask me, and I, and I must confess I don't have a great answer, they always ask me, so how do I know whether or not it's worth it for me yeah. to be uh, spending this? So you had to put together a case that said we should be sponsoring the Olympics, and that is a, that's a big number. It, it is a big number. Uh, it's a number we don't disclose, so it's, uh, it's obviously ask. a pretty big number. Um, you know, the Olympics are, are, are a great discussion item. Uh, because if you're not close to it, it's a it's just an expense to be able to put the rings on your business card. But let me give you an idea from a marketing standpoint how that's paid off. We expect to deliver between five hundred and six hundred million dollars worth of incremental revenue associated with the Beijing Games. Beijing is going to have spent forty billion dollars by the time August eighth of two thousand and eight rolls around preparing for these games, heavy on infrastructure. We happen to be an infrastructure-heavy business. And so by being a sponsor, we have a shot, just a shot, at that business. And uh, we get in line uh, in order to see whether or not we can uh, deliver the value to the Chinese government around the building of the stadiums, the water reuse facilities. Um, and we've been very successful. Like I said, between five and six hundred million dollars. We've already booked about twenty-five million dollars worth of revenue in Vancouver in British Columbia for the Winter Games of 2010, and we're really just getting going there. And we have people on the ground in London for the Summer Games of 2012. So the spend is huge, but more important than the spend around the Olympics is the learnings. And from a marketing standpoint, this is this is uh, really powerful. For 131 years, this company has been around, and we have delivered growth through our P&L silos. Mm -hmm. What we've had to learn in Beijing is how to present one face of General Electric, because the person in charge of the national stadium doesn't want to deal with a GE healthcare person, right. lighting person, water person, electrical person, security person. So we have used the Olympics as a pilot and a template to build a seamless 1GE offering, particularly around these large infrastructure projects. And so we behave differently now. We have learned how to adapt ourselves to the customer's desire. And I joke, for a company that's been around as long as we have, you know, the number one revelation continues to be that customers do not organize their buying behavior according to our P&L structure. Right, right. The Olympics is a big enough denominator to help prove that across the company. So you have a certain amount of money that you're going to spend on marketing. You've made a decision, Olympics, we're going to put a big share onto that. And I'm sort of curious how you decide how to allocate your spending. Obviously, every four years or maybe every two years, you know, there's the winter and the summer Olympics. That's a big chunk. But how do you decide your allocation process. Well, that the Olympic sponsorship is something that obviously goes all the way up the line to the CEO. You know, Jeff right. Immelt was was intimately involved in the, you know, he was the driver of the decision uh, to do that. But again, it it underscores this corporate versus business trade-off. So corporate has the sponsorship of the Olympics. Right. And then the business units have to band together within their budgets in order to deliver this one GE face to the customer. So the operating budget, if you will, for the Olympics, the operating budget tied to the driving of revenues is borne by the business units, not by corporate. And how do they decide how to allocate their, their spending over, you know, here's the Olympics, they've got, you know, other activities that they're engaging right. in? And, you know, initially, uh, we weren't really sure. And what we developed was a very methodical approach around the Olympics to say, we've done the interviews with the people who make the decisions around these infrastructure spends. We've analyzed who the local contractors are 
and we have determined what product gaps we possess. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the opportunity pool relative to the product gap, and you make a determination over whether or not it's a worthwhile economic venture to fill that gap, or perhaps partner with somebody right. uh, to fill that gap. So there's a, there's a whole economic analysis around what are the, uh, what's the opportunity associated with the Olympic spend, what is our value and our ability to fulfill that, where are the gaps, and how much would it cost to fill those gaps in order to improve our competitive position relative to the opportunity. And, and beyond the Olympics, same sort of process? Same process, and that's the beauty, is the Olympics has been a great laboratory for us. So that exact same approach I just described to you right. is now being transferred to Shanghai for the Shanghai Expo, which is going to occur in 2010 and is going to have a similar $40 billion spend. We also translated it over to Macau, where they're building $16 billion worth of casinos. Right. Poland is going to uh, have the European, European Soccer Cup uh, championship in a few years. They'll have a spend, a little, little more decentralized. But that same approach now we can take, and that guides us into how to create this one face of GE approach. It also gives you the economic analysis you need as the business leader to determine whether or not it's worth the effort to do something out of your normal uh, p and approach. Um, I, w I want us to make a transition from thinking about budget and allocation. And now that we've talked about that, I'd, I'd like for us to sort of think about your measurement side. How do you measure whether or not you're getting value out of any of this spend that you're doing? You know, I think we, we, uh, we're a company that's known for our financial discipline. Once we decide to do something, we measure it down to the point where we probably even can tell you how much it costs to measure uh, the measurement. Um, so we're very, very good. If we decide to launch a new product in PI, new product introduction, or if we decide to open up a regional office in Bangalore, uh, we can track the economic uh, economics associated with that. What we do not have good visibility into is the payoff associating with the marketing efforts upstream of the decision to take concrete action. So any one of the business units. So let me just make sure I understand that. When you say upstream, you mean before we've spent it, we, don't, we can't do a very good job of forecasting? No, because well, no, we've spent money. Before we, let's say we decide to make a new product. Okay. We've got that piece nailed. The spend that occurs in marketing in order to determine that we should make a new product in a certain fashion. Right. The ethnography exercise to see how people interact with our anesthesiology equipment, the secret shopper exercises we do associated with our private label credit cards. There's a lot of money spent there in the business units, and we have the opportunity to develop better methodology on measuring whether or not those are going to pay off in action. All right. So that's not uncommon, by the way. It, it's really right. hard to measure sort of what's the value of the marketing research, yep. what's the value of training. Mm -hmm. Those are really hard uh, to try and do. I imagine you know, on the marketing side, there's a lot of money spent uh, in various different businesses on trade shows. Correct. That's down pretty well. You can measure the economic value of uh, no, it's a tough trade to, show. It's tough to measure the economic value of a bread and butter trade show. Um, there's a certain gut feel that you have about what type of presence you need to have in, in whatever industry you participate in. Um, we've taken an interesting approach on, on that, which is we have gravitated over time from participating in trade shows to sponsoring industry-specific or customer-specific thought events. Mm -hmm. So we might, uh, so for example, in our oil and gas business in Florence, once a year, we will have the top almost 1,000 people in that industry together for a thought leadership conference sponsored by us, but including our competitors. Right. Um, we have moved towards having events like that as opposed to just participating in, in normal trade shows. That's our preference. And, and do you measure the impact of that event? No, no. We, okay. we should be measuring it anecdotally. Uh, we measure it, but I would tell you that we're not sophisticated enough right now to feel comfortable that I have a metric that's going to tell me if I spent $2 million to host this symposium in Florence, 
what I got out of that. So I'm presuming you have, these are the objectives that we have for that symposium. We have a budget that we're allocating for doing that symposium in Florence. Have I been invited to that? I don't, I don't know. I don't the food's so. very good. So yeah, make, that's what I heard. I'll make sure you're on the list next year. <laughs> um, but you know, do you know? It sort of is interesting to think back of have you know? How do we track whether or not we're accomplishing that, and if it's money well spent versus having spent on something yeah. else? I think it's an evolution, like anything, uh, Dave. You know, we this is something that's relatively new for us, and so right now, it's probably more in the bucket of is this a worthwhile expenditure to position ourselves as a thought leader in a very attractive industry? Right. And if the answer comes out as yes, you do it. What I would hope that we would do as we do more of these is get more sophisticated so we would, we would know the organic growth rate of Dave Riebstein, Inc. as, uh, as they arrived in Florence and that we would have come out of that conference with very specific actions that we want to take relative to our commercial activities and that client, and that we could measure the increment in the organic growth rate, but we're not there yet. One of the things that makes it difficult is that there sort of is a short-term impact, and then there's a longer-term right. impact. Even when we think about sponsoring the Olympics, you know, you It's talk, not transactional. It's not transactional. And so you can say, well, we got this incremental business that goes into the infrastructure in Beijing, but then that might lead to some follow-on business and right. so forth. Do you try and capture any in, in any sophisticated way or any loose way, both the short-term effect as well as the long-term effect? One thing that has become very topical for our business units over the last few years that we're doing a much better job of measuring is customer retention. Right. Uh, and But I, I would be... Um, out ahead of myself if I told you I had a, an R-squared correlation between, um, you know, our investment in thought leadership and customer retention. But customer retention is a good metric uh, for us as well. And you look at how expenditures affect that retention? Very we have in certain, in certain in circumstances. Certain but again, it comes back to um, that would apply in a case where we have decided upon a specific action that results in a, in a difference on how we interact with our client. I can, I can give you a quick example. Um, we are, we're the world's largest non-bank bank. We have a unit called commercial finance, which uh, is, uh, does a lot of things from financing jet aircraft to equipment leasing. And it's actually comprised of 44 distinct sales organizations. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago, our vice chairman decided that um, for our top 3,000 customers, our approach was confusing enough that it justified putting a single relationship manager to act as a traffic controller for these 44 different sales organizations with these very large companies. Um, we know that we spent $20 million to create that marketing organization. In the first year that we did that, the organic growth rate for those 3,000 customers went from 17% to 50%. We went, so $8 billion to $12 billion. It'll be $18 billion this year, the second full year. We went from 1.1 products per customer to 1.4, and we're headed to 1.8. Mm -hmm. So we have very good metrics when we decide to do something concretely. Right. All of the exercises, all of the analysis, all of the customer feedback that was upstream for the couple of years before that was decided to create that organization was not measured. Yeah, not surprising. And, and you're certainly not alone. Yeah. Um, I, I try to think about sort of, we spend a lot for customer retention. You mentioned that. Do you measure customer lifetime value? The, the value of a customer over their life? That is, what's, what's it worth to acquire a customer? And I bring that up. You talked about retention. We do in our flow businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so in our consumer finance business or our small ticket uh, equipment finance business like, uh, like copier leasing, we do measure acquisition cost. Uh, it's a little more difficult in locomotives when you have six railroads in North America. Right. So, uh, and, and we have more 
transaction businesses than we have flow businesses. But the flow businesses do. They can tell you that it costs $100, for example, to to acquire a credit card holder. And they can say, and when we acquire a credit card holder over their life, this is what they're they worth? They can, yes. I would think they would have that right. done pretty well. So much of uh, so I'm trying to think about various different metrics, and you talked about you know uh, uh, acquisition, retention. We could think about brand, and GE's got you know by various different forms of people have evaluated the the value of the brand, and GE's always you know in the top two or three. Right, that's there. Um, do, do you measure what activities affect brand and how much they affect brand? We measure. Uh, we, we we love always being in the top on those branding studies. It's still a little bit magic right. uh, in terms of how those values are determined. A more pra- we take it down to a practical application, which is typically we're going to measure business executives and whether or not they have a positive opinion of General Electric and whether they perceive us as being a leading technology player. Um, and so we will measure the efficacy of our advertising and branding and public relations activities by participating in brand recognition uh, and brand perception uh, surveys. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I want to think about any measurement tools that you might have for trying to capture that and whether or not you've got some specific measurement tools that you use, like for, um, I guess, promoting the brand. Uh, for and I'm talking about customers promoting the brand. So you've got a measure of customer satisfaction that you have. Um, do you have any other sort of measurement tools that you regularly use across the various businesses outside of branding? Outside of branding, but we're we uh, company wide, we've adopted the Net Promoter Score right as a measurement of customer satisfaction. Uh, in fact, I had the Net Promoter Score advocates call uh, this morning. We do that every month. Um, and, and that's across all businesses. You that is live, across you live every business unit, pretty NPS. religiously. Yeah, we, you know, we've done a lot of different methodologies. We had voice of customer. Uh, I was the Six Sigma leader for half of the company uh, back in the in the late 1990s on the financial services side. Um, we like NPS not because it's the secret sauce, but because we're a a very diversified, highly complex company that does everything from build nuclear power plants to provide private label credit cards to somebody in Poland. Um, NPS is is such a simplistic tool Mm -hmm. to measure customer satisfaction. And the beauty of NPS is in capturing the verbatims of customers who wouldn't do business with you again. Uh, That it it works for a company like GE. You know, it's tough for us to use something that... um, has a lot of rules around it or a lot of guidelines. It's easier for us to push simplistic concepts across a company like ours. And how long have you been using Net Promoter Score? I think we're in our third year of uh, of NPS. Right. And are there other sort of tools of measurement uh, that you use or analytics that you use that is sort of pervasive across all the different businesses? Um, NPS is the only one that goes across all uh, business units. Customer retention would be the second most prevalent uh, measurement, and then you get down into the uh, financial metrics of return on an equity and return on investment. And uh, and do you look at brand on a specific business unit level as well? No, our consumer businesses would would look at brand. So appliances and lighting, um, and our consumer credit card company would look at their brand and how their brand was positioned relative to the competition, um, and in terms of recognition. They would not take that down to an estimate of the value of the brand. We only roll that up at the GE uh, level, and that's really done by external parties. We would, we would, for example, do a corporate brand study in China, right. where we had a um, last year. Uh, you know, General Electric's a very big uh, company, and and we take it for granted sometimes that people know who we are. And we did a brand study amongst Chinese business executives, and uh, the good news was that. 22 or 23% of the Chinese business exec- executives had a positive opinion of General Electric, which is high for a company that is in China, not yeah. consumer-focused, and didn't really do any advertising. Uh, I think 21% think we make automobiles, which we learned about in the study. Well, you so, got the G at the beginning. <laughs> now, so. Well, and we get confused for General Motors <laughs> right. uh, because the Chinese characters are the same. So um, it's interesting what you can learn out of those uh, those branding studies. Huh. 
Okay. Um, do you do a lot of experimentation that allow you to sort of test what works and what doesn't work? And then do you take that and also share that, what your learnings from any of that to different parts of the businesses? We do. Um, and I'd say that the most of the learnings in terms of, in terms of brand positioning um, and segmentation have come from our consumer finance business. So they, for example, uh, would do a behavioral study or needs-based study, and they could tell you that a female between the ages of 25 and 35 in Poland uh, would likely behave this way if we increased the interest rate on her credit card by 2%. That level of granularity that, that is so endemic in the consumer world um, uh, can provide guidance to the B2B world uh, as well, and give us some uh, some impetus for uh, d you know uh, digging into uh, that type of behavioral or needs based segmentation. So I can understand how we c we can do that in Poland and learn from Poland, and maybe you know extract that and say, and so in Romania we would think right. we would see a certain. But can you take that to uh, you know to jet engines? Any of that learning? You, you actually can. Um, it's going to be. Uh, harder, you know, we're a company, I think we would probably tell you that as successful as we've been historically, we're a company that built new products because we could. Right. And then we went out right. and sold them. And taking that information, becoming intimate with the customer and understanding what they value, what they ascribe value to and what their needs are, feeds an entirely different view of product development and uh, what we'll sell in the future. And so um, the understanding, I'll, I'll pick railroads because that's a good example. Six customers in North America. Understanding, though, that rising fuel costs and the onset of increased regulatory controls over the emissions of locomotives and getting that knowledge and understanding that that was what was keeping those railroads up at night was one of the primary catalysts for our development of new locomotive technology, which has become known as the Evolution locomotive. This, uh, we, we understood that we had to deliver this. We built a locomotive that delivers the power of a 16-cylinder diesel with only 12. It resulted in a 3 to 5% cost advantage relative to its competition, and it puts out 40% fewer emissions. That business now is sold out from a production standpoint for over a year. So it's the same fundamental concept, understanding what your customer ascribes value to, what your customer's needs are, what's around the corner from your customer's standpoint, in this case, increasing regulations, and translating that back into what do I need in order to succeed in that environment. Um, my, my sense is that GE is really good at being um, sort of analytic in what it is that they do. Um, and as you said, you really have great, once you go downstream, you really have great uh, measurement. What do you do in the absence of data for making decisions? Because I assume you know, lots of new environments, things that you haven't tried before. What's the decision-making process there? Yeah. Um, uh, in, in the worst of cases, uh, you do nothing. Right. Uh, and it's, it's a common issue with us. Uh, I wouldn't say, with the exception of a couple of our our large-scale consumer businesses, I would say we're data poor uh, in terms of that information. And the transition we've made over the last few years um, is, okay, let's not get hung up in the data we have. Let's concentrate on gathering a statistically significant group of data that we can base some decisions off of, rather than simply act on our hypothesis or not act uh, for, for lack of information. So we are getting better about figuring out how to get out there and beta test quickly. So beta test, gather a little bit of data, use that insight rather than just intuition. And iterate it. And then iterate and going forward. Yep. Okay. Okay. We've spent, you know, we've, we've just talked about sort of your, uh, your overall measurement and, and how you try and, and deal with that. Um, I want to think about who in the organization is responsible for sort of measuring the productivity of marketing? Is, is that you that's responsible for that? Or I assume you've got... It's actually, in our structure, it's the business leader. 
who is who is the person who ultimately makes the call as to whether or not his or her marketing organization uh, has been effective. And each one of them is going to do that differently based upon whatever their growth metrics are that they're prioritizing. So whether it's retention or simple organic growth rate or profitability, those are the high level measurements that they're going to put on the marketing organization. Um, but again, it's very easy to deliver the metrics on those relative to specific projects that have been launched. Uh, where we still have opportunity and need to get better is all of the other marketing activity. And so we are promoting stronger linkage with the commercial agenda and the marketing agenda. And one of the changes we made in that respect, we used to train our marketing people and our sales leaders separately. They had two different curriculums. Right. Today they have the same curriculum. And we encourage them, in fact, to send as teams. And so what that fosters is an environment where the marketing leader has his or her top five priorities. And they can draw a very straight line to the top five priorities of the commercial leader. Mm -hmm. If we can do that in all of our business units, then we have the mechanism, we have the framework in place to measure the efficacy of their of all of their marketing activities uh, because they should, if they're successful, result in action on the commercial side. Right. Now, you've sort of said, you know, our number one objective is organic growth. Some of that growth is going to happen if you did no marketing activity. Do you have any sort of way of measuring the the marketing performance? We do, we do. At, the, at but again, at the high level, and there's okay. a lot of other components that are that are intertwined with it. Uh, we measure ourselves against the growth rate in the industries that we participate in at as granular a level level as is available. But to I'm us. trying to think about how marketing contributes to that. Mm -hmm. You measure how marketing contributes to that growth rate. Again based upon specific projects that have been undertaken. Right. So if we decide to change this product or launch this initiative or roll out these services or open an office in this territory, we can measure it very granularly. But no, it's not a reflection just on marketing. It's a reflection on the entire commercial activity. We don't break down the marketing piece individually. Yeah. And so you don't have any standard, you know, return on marketing investment no. metrics that you try and no. impose. No. Do you feel pressure from your CEO or CFO to come up with a measure of No, we don't. We've had, you know, I know it's very topical. Right. Um, and we are always open-minded uh, to it. Um, we haven't viewed it as something that uh, that we've felt compelled to uh, to move forward with. Right. Uh, if uh, if one day we're Given a potential solution that doesn't seem bureaucratic across a large organization like GE that does so many different things, I think it's something we'd consider. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not something that we have felt that we've you know, ever seen something uh, out there that compels us to do it now. Um, if there was one thing that you would change in your overall you know, measurement of marketing performance or tracking what it is that you're doing, what would that be? I would insist upon a greater linkage to the activities that occur in marketing and the strategic and tactical priorities of a business. And I believe that the top 10 deliverables for whoever the chief marketing officer of a business unit is, they ought to be able, with their other growth colleagues, the sales leadership or the business leadership in general, they ought to all be able to articulate how their top agenda directly impacts the top growth agenda of the business. And if they can't, they need to step back and reflect on whether or not uh, they are aligned and whether or not the money they're getting ready or the resource they're getting ready to utilize for those deliverables is a good investment. Yeah. Is that happening today or is that something that you're... Well, I think it is happening today. I would say it hasn't necessarily happened historically. Right. Um, you know, it's uh, the, a sign of a disconnected functional agenda is when you ask the chief marketing officer to to tell you his or her accomplishments for the year uh, and you ask the uh, the sales leader to say what the accomplishments of the marketing organization uh, were and you get two different lists they ought to be the same right and I think we're doing a much better job of becoming linked on that does each business unit have its own uh, sort of marketing dashboard most do most do, and they would be the metrics that are important to that business unit, such as new customer acquisition or cost of acquisition or customer retention. Uh, and do they aggregate up to a corporate uh, dashboard? No, they don't. No. It's a little too disparate. 
Yeah, yeah I mean, um, you've got so many different businesses. Yeah, we've. Uh, it's one of the uh, one of the issues um, in a company like this is uh, now. When I was running business units within General Electric, I would clearly have a dashboard. Uh, you start to roll up things that are so uncommon and unconnected and occur across different customers and in different fashions, and it becomes noise very, very quickly. Yeah, Light bulbs to, uh, right. to energy or yeah. to locomotive engines yeah. is quite a stretch. Um, what do you wish I asked you that I haven't? Um, I've known you for a while, and we've had so many conversations. I try and... Uh, parse what we're talking about here and, and what we've talked about in other settings. You know, I think the, the question that I would like to be asked is what's different about market marketing's position in General Electric today versus 10 years ago. So why don't you ask me that question? Okay. Uh, Dan, I've known you for a number of years. I'm curious, what's different about marketing's position today than it was 10 years ago at General Electric? The, um, it's a good question. <laughs> the, the company is, GE it reinvents itself you know, every, every 15 years. We are in the early stages of reinventing General Electric in this era as a marketing company. We have a CEO who cut his teeth at Procter & Gamble, the mecca of uh, marketing in a lot of people's minds, and who has a vision of marketing being a leading function uh, in our company, in a company that has traditionally been known as a company where finance and legal and right. process uh, were leading disciplines. And we excelled at that. We excelled at that in the 1990s, the era of productivity, the era of Six Sigma. Growth, organic growth, is something that you need a strong marketing organization in order to deliver. And it's a team sport as opposed to an individual sport. Mm -hmm. And so when I look back over the last five or six years in GE, I see that marketing mindset really being pushed. I see the conversations starting with the customer, not your cost number. We still are very focused on that, but it's what's the customer need? What's your com what are your competitors doing? How are you positioned? So there's a whole cultural shift to focusing on the customer and organic growth that marketing is being brought along with and hopefully at some point very soon we'll start leading. Um, and it's a, it's a great place to be in marketing right now in a company like General Electric where you have somebody who gets it where uh, we're undergoing this transformation from a productivity company to a productive growth company. I definitely see it, and I, I have seen the transition over the 10 years, and it's great. And um, the sequel to the question that I asked you, what's happened in the past 10 years? 10 years from now, how will marketing look different than it does right now? I would think marketing is going to be one of the core functions in the company. And today, um, we are still a company that's evolving into a uh, market-backed company as opposed to P&L forward. I think a decade from now that we will be firmly cemented in a company that starts with the market and takes it from there. You know, and Dave, we've got to be. Our global environment is so much different today than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the growth today is in the emerging markets. Right two to three times the growth that's occurring in the developed world. This year, for the first year ever, half of our revenues, more than half of our revenues, are from outside of the U.S. And, and when you look at a market like India or China or the Middle East, you know, 10 years ago, you would have said, Dan, who are you concerned about in India? And I would have said the usual suspects, Siemens, Toshiba, Philips. Today, I have to say all of those and I have to say Tata, Mahindra. I've got to say great local companies in China of hire. I've got to name companies that you and I didn't know the names of five years ago right. that are going to be global powerhouses tomorrow. Our competitive landscape has changed. You can't develop products and marketing plans in Waukesha, Wisconsin, and expect them to be 
effective in Bangalore, India. You have to be there. You have to understand what the Indian customer wants. Marketing is required in order to understand that and translate it back into business needs. It's a different landscape today than it has ever been for a company like General Electric. The world is flat. So what it is that I see is is that, first of all, I think GE has really developed a reputation around innovation. And it's all around this growth and organic growth. And, And that's a transition. You know, rather than just being efficient, right. it's innovation, and and so I think a lot has been accomplished there. I'm, I'm going to move us back to the metrics just for a second. Do you have metrics about innovation? You know, what innovations are happening, how much they're happening, whatever. You know, You're very similar to marketing, Dave. When we decide to launch an imagination breakthrough, right, we can measure it down to minutia. It is the, and when we decide to launch a new product in our traditional new product introduction process, we capture uh, all of the metrics uh, around that. We do not have a general high level innovation metric. Yeah, or. And, or, and I would struggle to understand what that would be, um, but would love to hear thoughts on it, but uh, we don't have anything that captures innovation at the high level. Hmm. You can measure Percentage. how much of your revenue, incremental revenue, is associated with new products. And, of course, we do um, things like that. But uh, it's difficult to come up with a metric that calculates how much out-of-the-box thinking is worth. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. You're I, welcome. I appreciate you spending the time. It's uh, fun to see you, as always. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us for Measured Thoughts. I'm Dave Reepstein.